Hello and welcome back to this video series where I'm teaching you all how to do archival data research uh, within an accounting or finance context uh, using MATLAB. So in this video and in the probably two videos to follow, probably take up three videos total, I'm going to teach you all how to replicate a seminal paper. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at the famous Ball and Brown paper from 1968. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, most PhD students, when they get into accounting, an accounting PhD program, um, they will encounter this paper pretty pretty early on. It was a seminal paper that opened up a whole new branch of accounting research. Um, previous to this paper, there were some papers that were like this, but this paper really set the standard for accounting research moving forward. So I'm going to show you how to replicate the results in this paper. Not every result, but the major results, including the famous figure, which we'll see here in a little bit. <coughs> so in this paper, you can see the title, An Empirical Evaluation of Accounting Income Numbers. The whole point of this paper, <coughs> Professors Ball and Brown are arguing right here in the third paragraph, you can see the whole motivation for their paper. Prior to this time, um, income numbers, accounting income or net income or earnings, if you will, uh, ha had been said to lack meaning and therefore have doubtful utility. And as you can read here, the critics of income stemmed, uh, it says here, in part from the patchwork development of accounting practices to meet new situations as they arise. <coughs> Accountants have had to deal with consolidations, leases, mergers, R&D, and so forth. Because accounting lacks an all-embracing theoretical framework, dissimilarities in practices have evolved, and as a consequence, net income is an aggregate of components which are not homogeneous. And because of this, net income is alleged to be a meaningless figure, not unlike the difference between 27 tables and 8 chairs as an analogy. And under this view, net income can be defined only as the result of the application of a set of procedures, x1, x2, so forth, to a set of events, y1, y2, so forth, with no other definitive substantive meaning at all. And then they quote Canning from 1929, and versions of this argument appear in these other places that they cite. What is set out as a measure of net income can never be supposed to be a fact in any sense at all, except that it is the figure that results when the accountant has finished applying the procedures which he adopts. In other words, it's, it's just a meaningless figure. Prior to this time, there had been many analytical attempts to develop measurements capable of definitive interpretation. So that wasn't what they were wanting to do in this paper. Uh, they point out that what is at issue is the fact that an analytical model does not itself assess the significance of departures from its implied measurements. And they say it is dangerous to conclude, therefore, in the absence of further empirical testing, that a lack of substantive meaning implies a lack of utility. So income may have, uh, may hard to define, but it doesn't mean, just because it's hard to define doesn't mean that it lacks utility or that it's not useful. And so that was the whole point of this paper, is to design an empirical test to kind of show that income does have utility, it, does, it is useful, regardless of whether it's easy to define or not. So that's the whole point of their paper. And so they had to come up with a test that they could do, and if they did that test and got some reasonable results, that a critic could look at the results and, 
and see evidence that income does have useful utility or it's useful. And that was the cool thing about this paper is the test that they came up with. So what they do is <clears throat> they end up relating income to stock price movement. So specifically, they construct two alternative models of what the market expects income to, to be. Um, forget about the two here. They, they construct a model of what market ex the market expects income to be, and then they investigate the market's reaction in terms of the stock price reaction when its expectations of what income should be proved false. So they measure, they come up with a measure or a model for income, then they derive deviations from that model and call those unexpected income. And then they look at the market reaction to the unexpected income. And so the, you can kind of think of this paper as there's two pieces. We first have to have a model for income. And they decide to use this particular model for income. They regress they run a regression here. The change in income, the change in income for firm J over period T, we regress that on the change, the average change, or the change in the average income of all other firms other than firm J. So the market income the change in the average income of all other firms in the market in time t. So they run this regression. They get an error term. I'm sorry, they run this regression. They get the estimated coefficients, a1 and a2. And then in the next period, they put those coefficients into the actual change in market income, change in average market income, and get the predicted change. There should be a hat right here. Get the predicted change in income for the firm. And then the unexpected income or the unexpected change in income is the actual income minus the, unexpected, minus the expected change in income. There, this should be a hat right here. So it is this forecast error right here, the unexpected income or the abnormal income. This is what they assume to be the new information conveyed by the present income number. This is the new, inc the new information conveyed by the, by the present income number. So we're not looking at levels of income. We're trying to figure out for a given income announcement in a given year, for an earnings announcement in a given year, what's the information contained in that announcement? And the way they get at that is they measure this forecast error. How does that income change this forecast error? And that's it's that it's that amount of information that's the new information in the income number. So we need to model this or we need to if we're going to replicate the results, we're going to have to compute unexpected income for our sample of firm years. The second piece is the market's reaction. How do they measure the market's reaction? They measure the market's reaction yeah, as the monthly price relative for firm J in month M minus unity minus 1 well, the monthly price relative is just 1 plus the firm's monthly rate of return. So when we subtract run 1, we're just left with the firm's monthly rate of return. So this is the monthly rate of return for firm J in month M. And this is the market rate of return in month M. <clears throat> and the residual from this regression represents the extent to which the realized return differs from the expected return, conditional upon the estimated regression parameters 
and the market index. So they're using unexpected returns or abnormal returns to capture the market's reaction to unexpected income and to unexpected income. And the unexpected income is the new information contained in the present income number. So we've computed unexpected returns or abnormal returns already in a previous video. I've shown you how to do that. So we'll do the same thing here. But for unexpected income, that's something new. So that's what we need to do. And now if we look up here, this first unexpected income, there's other models. There's other models of income. Since Ball and Brown, 1968, other people have used a different way to get the unexpected income. So what they do is the way that most people do now, most researchers use, is they use analyst forecasts. And they take the difference between the actual income and the median, the median analyst forecast of income. So there's a bunch of analysts that forecast a given firm's income for a given period. Take the median of their forecasts as the expectation of what income should be, not this model as the expectation. Don't run a time series model. Just let the median analyst forecast be the expectation of income. Take the actual income that the firm announces minus the median analyst forecast, and that is this, the unexpected income. That's the way present research does it. But back in Ball and Brown's time, they didn't have data on analyst forecasts. So they uh, ran a model, a time series model using a given firm's prior observations to compute that firm's unexpected income going forward. The, the downside of the Ball-Brown way is we need, one of the downsides is for a given firm, you need a, a pretty good number of observations for the model for these regression parameter estimates, A1 hat and A2 hat, to even be viable. You can't run this regression with two observations and get viable parameters for A1 hat and A2 hat, viable estimations. You need a certain number of observations. Um, and, and when you require more observations, your sample size shrinks. You don't have as many firms. And you're left with firms that are bigger, who have been around longer, and things like that. So that's a downside, a limitation of their... Um, paper. I think they mentioned that right we'll get to this other stuff here in a second their famous graph I think they mentioned the the main downsides somewhere in their paper They do somewhere in here. I just don't remember exactly where they mention it. But um, I guess let's get let's get to some of the results. So. And we'll go into their actual, uh, their sample and things like that when we actually start doing the code here in MATLAB because that'll become really important. We're going to end up replicating table three here. Uh, we're not going to replicate table one, two, four. We're, we are going to have to do we're, we're going to have to use this formula in the paper so that we can make we can replicate figure one which is their really famous figure so here's the result basically so time zero here is the month that the firm announced earnings now say and these are all 1231 fiscal year end firms in their sample so the fiscal year in, year ends on 1231 <clears throat> and then the firms announce earnings 
you know, usually by March of next year. And month zero is the is the, the month in which they announced earnings. Variable one, variable two, and variable three are all variables they use for unexpected income. In computing that change in income, they have different measures of income. They use just regular net income. One of their that's variable one. Variable two is earnings per share, and then variable three is something else. We're just going to do in in our replication. We're just going to do variable one and variable two. But let's just take net income if that's the measure of income. Well, they find that. Um, so minus 12 is 12 months prior to the earnings announcement date. What do we have here? We have month relative to annual report announcement date on the x-axis. And we have the abnormal performance index on the y-axis. And this abnormal performance index is, it's basically the cumulative abnormal return, but add one to it. That's what it is. It's the cumulative abnormal return, but add one to that. So it's like if you invest, invested a dollar 12 months prior into the, into the company on average, what would that dollar be worth? And what they found is the portfolios which had positive unexpected incomes whenever they announced at month zero for firms that had positive if you form a portfolio of those firms that had positive unexpected income, in other words, their forecast error here was a positive number. When the sign of this is positive, positive unexpected incomes, then those are these lines up here. Take variable one. If they had positive unexpected income where income was measured using net income, then if you had invested a dollar 12 months prior into those firms, then your dollar would be worth a dollar and seven cents on the day that they announced their earnings 12 months later. In other words, um, prices, market prices for these firms were already moving up before these firms announced their positive announcement, the market already knew, already knew what the information would be contained in that in that announcement. It was going to be positive. It would be good news. And even after the announcement, though, the interesting thing they find is that still the stock prices still go up after the announcement. So there is some information in the announcement itself. Otherwise, you would expect the prices just to remain flat or to go back down to zero. Not go back down. To, yeah, the price is not to go back down to zero, but to go down such that your, your abnormal performance index or your cumulative abnormal return plus one would go back to one. But it doesn't. So I guess there's two things really cool in this graph. First, the market knows beforehand that the earnings announcement is going to be good news. And it knows beforehand that the earnings announcement is going to be bad news. These are the bad news firms, the firms who announce earnings and they have negative unexpected income, negative forecast error. Prices already were going down 12 months prior for these firms. And this is steeper than this. So this is not a, a symmetric graph here. And then after the announcement, prices still continue to go downwards for variables one and variable two. If you go out here far enough, eventually they taper off and they, they, they end up going, I don't remember if they end up going back to, um, they taper off. They stop going down. And so I guess to the left of this vertical line, the one story is the market knows the market is all knowing in some sense. It already knows what information is going to be announced in earnings. In other words, the earnings, the portion of the information in earnings that the market already has figured out in advance, well, that's not informative to anyone, right? So in some sense, earnings aren't informative. But to the right of this vertical line, we have what is called post-earnings announcement drift, where 
after earnings have been announced, prices still drift upwards in this case, downwards in this case. In other words, there must be still some information in earnings, in accounting earnings, um, that the market is responding to, as you can see. Up here in the positive news part, they the market already knew in advance the news would be positive, so the market start was going up. But then after the news was announced, it was positive. Prices still went up f further, which means that there wasn't the market couldn't didn't anticipate all of the positive news, as you can see. Same thing with the negative news. Conversely, so post earnings announcement drift is very hard has been very hard for researchers to try to explain and to date I don't think anyone has come up with a reasonable explanation for why prices keep drifting upwards for up to four months later three months later actually up to three months later if markets really are efficient and prices pretty quickly reflect all available public information then why are prices still drifting upwards here and drifting downwards in this case three months afterwards so there's a lot going on in this graph Researchers can't explain to the right of the graph what causes it, why that's happening. And that's so their paper is, is known as the post earnings announcement. They were the first paper to document post earnings announcement drift. Which means that there is some information content in earnings. If they did not find PEAD here, P E A D, post earnings announcement drift, then that would kind of, uh, it would kind of, um, be evidence of the point that they were trying to fight against in this paper, and that is that earnings lack utility and they're not useful. Finding post-earnings announcement drift was crucial to their paper. It proved that earnings, there are some utility to earnings. They're useful, at least from the market standpoint. If you're going to use market prices to measure usefulness, they're useful. And that's another discussion for another day. So yeah, that's their paper. We're going to replicate this figure. All right, let's go into MATLAB. We first have to compute unexpected income for our firms. Um, so let's, let's go here to MATLAB. And we're going to use a live script instead of a regular script. And we're going to go ahead and give ourselves some some comments. So this code replicates the seminal Ball and Brown 1968 paper's main result regarding the information content. Or maybe I should just say it this way. Uh, whoops. I didn't mean to do that. So what I'm going to do is drag this all the way over here. Um, let's go up. Let's go up here. And then let's go here like this. I didn't mean to go past this point. I try to give myself a nice little title 
to each of my code blocks or code files like this, something like this. All right, as we always do, we're gonna clear our variables, clear the workspace. We're gonna clear our command window. Now there's nothing in the command window, there's no, nothing down here and there's nothing in our workspace, but by convention, we always run those two commands first. Now we're gonna bring the data in. The first data is coming from CompuStat, and it's annual data, and I've already have it saved on my computer. And it's in, I have my uh, directory pointed to the right data folder in MATLAB, so it'll bring up all the files that are in this folder, and it's going to be this one. So in their paper, they use a sample time period 1946 through 1966. 20 year sample time period. So we're going to also use a 20 year sample time period. Um, but I'm, I picked 1970 to 1990. And I picked that for a reason. Um, we're going to need access to some to a variable in the quarterly CompuStat database. And quarterly CompuStat isn't available until 1960 uh, or 1970 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Either 70 or right before 70. I think 70. And so that's why I started with 70. We'll just go the 20 years, 70 to 90. But we'll see if our results are similar to theirs. We want to preserve variable names in our file. If you haven't watched my previous videos, I explain all these commands. So we're loading the CompuStat annual data. The read table function brings in a data set. Preserve variable names means that when the data set comes in, keep the same variable names that were in the data set. Uh, yeah. And then we're going to load CompuStat quarterly. And then we can just copy and paste all of this here. change this and then finally we're going to load stock price data from crisp there's only two data sources CompuStat and crisp for this to replicate this paper All right, let's bring those data sets in so we can see what we're dealing with. For the 1970-1990 annual CompuStat data, as you can see here, the variables that are, that are automatically chosen are GV key, data date, F year, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one this one and the variables that I actually chose and, and coast at this means are they inactive or active still as a company um, but the variables that I actually chose are Ajax the adjustment factor the cumulative adjustment factor uh, fiscal year end month this gives us what what month or fiscal year ends 12 being December 8 being August for example uh, CASHO is common shares outstanding. How many shares do they have outstanding as of this, at the, as of the end of this fiscal year? This is earnings per share, including extraordinary items. Uh, this is net income. These are our two measures of, of uh, income that we're going to use to be in line with Ball and Brown. Uh, in their paper, variable one, they use net income for income, and variable two, they used EPS. I think they talk about that. Uh, they don't talk about it here, but later. So we're going to be referencing back the paper, back to the paper a lot in our, in this replication project, because we're trying to replicate the paper. We had to be, make sure we do exactly what they say, or we're not going to get the results that they got, 
or similar results. Of course, we are using a different sample. They used 1946 to 1966. We're using 1970, 1990. But if that main result that I showed you, figure one, if that holds, it's going to hold no matter what sample. Or we can see if it holds through time as well. We may, we may, once we get the code working on this data, then we can just change the data set to like the last 20 years and see does do we get the same result. Just change the starting data set. Once we get the code running on this data set, then all we have to do is come in here and change the starting data set. Just see how the results change as, as we go through time. And then for CompuStat quarterly, the only variable we need from the CompuStat quarterly um, data set here is RDQ. This is the report date of quarterly earnings. Oh, we also need the quarter variable. What quarter was it? F quarter. We're only looking at annual earnings announcements. So we're only looking for where F quarter is four. And we need the report date of quarterly earnings. We do need the date so that we can know what month they reported earnings. Right, we need that for figure one here because if you remember figure one, month zero is their annual report announcement date or the date they reported fourth quarter fourth quarterly earnings. And it's the month that they reported. So we do need the date. We don't need the actual day. We don't have to have that, but we need the month. All right, and then from CRISP, we have our share code variable, which tells us whether it's a common stock or not. If it's 10 or 11, it's a common stock. Otherwise, it's not. So we, we only want to keep share codes 10 or 11. And then this is our monthly return variable. And then we have our equally weighted return on the whole market variable. So we're going to need that. We need the market return down here when we do the markets reaction this right here is the market return for month M so that's exactly what this would be that's the market return for the month of December 1985 for example equally weighted where we put equal weight in all the stocks in the market we're not going to do a value weighted return but we could do that and see how our results if they were robust to that but I'm sure they would be all right so I guess the first thing we should do is we need to adjust the reason we need common shares outstanding here in this CompuSet annual is you'll see the reason coming up later but we need to adjust the sh common shares outstanding for prior split stock splits and or dividends so the way we adjust common shares outstanding is we multiply it by the cumulative adjustment factor, which is this variable. You multiply it by the adjustment factor. If this was a stock price as of the end of a given month, then how do we convert, how do we get that stock price adjusted for previous stock splits or dividends? we would divide it by the adjustment factor. But if it shares outstanding, we multiply it by the adjustment factor. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's create a new variable. We'll call it ADJ CSHO, adjusted common shares outstanding. And that's going to be equal to the current variable. We'll use dot indexing here with our table variables, the current variable, and then multiply it by the adjustment factor. The thing is, though, this is a variable. This is a column of numbers, and this is a column of numbers, right? We're multiplying this column by this column. So we need to do element-wise multiplication. So you put a dot there. We want this times this, then this times this. We're going to have a separate variable over here in, in variable in column 16. It's going to be called ADJCSHO. And it's going to be the element wise product of these, of column 9 and column 12.
as always, I give very detailed comments for each line so that a beginning student will understand what's going on and or myself, if I come back to this program, you know, a couple weeks from now and I forgot what the program does, I have comments beside each line. Now let's go ahead and delete variables that we don't need. So we can put them in brackets like that. We can put them in brackets like this as well. It doesn't matter. But the variables we don't need are data date. We don't need this variable. All we need is the fiscal year because we're only going to keep fiscal year fiscal year in 12 firms and we just need the year. If their fiscal year ends in the month of December, then their fiscal year and their calendar year will be the same always. We don't need this data date variable. We don't need, there's a lot of variables we don't need. We don't need the industry format variable. INDL means industrials and FS means financial services. I don't care what industry, the, I don't care whether the company is a regular company, industrials, or financial services. I'm, they're going to be in the database. They're going to be in the data, so I'm not, we don't need cons, cons we don't need this variable, this variable, um, don't need this variable, don't need this variable, don't need ticker symbol. A lot of these things we can get, you, get rid of. We don't need the currency variable. Uh, we don't need the uh, costat variable. We don't need ticker. We don't need Ajax anymore because we've already, we don't need common shares outstanding anymore because we've already got our adjusted common shares outstanding. Once we run this line, let's run this line here. Here's our adjusted common shares outstanding. But let's just go ahead and get rid of all these variables that we don't need. So I'll just go down the list. We don't need Ajax. We don't need console. Uh, we don't need costat. We don't need CSHO anymore. We don't need the currency variable. We don't need this. Uh, we don't need this. We don't need this. And we don't need ticker. All right, let's do that. That gets rid of a lot of the variables. Well, it should have. Oh, I got to set them equal to, sorry, like that to delete them. Set them equal to empty and then it deletes them. So we just have left these variables. All right, let's um, do the same thing with CompuStat quarterly. CompuStat quarterly, we don't need day-to-date. Uh, -date. We don't need a lot of the most of the variables. We don't need console. We don't need costat. We don't need the currency. We don't need the data calendar quarter. We don't need the data format. Uh, we don't need the data fiscal quarter. We don't need industry format. Um, pop source, tick. We do need these four variables. Fiscal year, fiscal quarter. Um, an RDQ. So let's set this equal to empty.
Whoops. All right, delete variables. All right, let's do that. All right. Let's go ahead and, whoops. Let's go ahead and remove all non-1231 firms. So CompuStat annual, um, any rows where you don't see a 12 in the F year variable column. Any of those rows, all columns, delete. That usually gets rid of, if you see how many observations we have, 158,649, that usually gets rid of a third of the observations. About two thirds of the companies have um, 1231 fiscal year ends. One third don't. And actually, I guess back then at that time it was an e more even mix. So I deleted almost half. So we're left with that many observations. So all these firms have a fiscal year end month of December. Uh, why are we doing that? I believe it, it says in the paper, and you can find where it says it, but it says in the paper that, I'm trying to find where it says it. When they talk about their data, it's probably where it says it. They got their annual report announcement dates or their their fourth quarterly earnings announcement dates, if you want to call them that, from the Wall Street Journal. They didn't have a uh, CompuStat quarterly database back then. They had to collect by hand. And the stock prices they got from Chris, but they used to be on big tapes that you had to read into the computer. But it says somewhere in here, here it is, inclusion criteria. Firms included in the study met the following criteria. Earnings data available on CompuStat for each of the years 1946 through 1966. So a firm had to have data for all 20 years, or that's 21 years, all 21 years. Fiscal year had to be ending in December 31st. Price data available on crisp tapes for at least 100 months over the sample time period. Didn't say they had to be consecutive. And of course, Wall Street Journal announcement dates available. And we'll get to this next part. This is really important here to understand how, to, how they did it. <coughs> so... There you go. Now let's remove all firm year observations that have missing values on any of the variables. Like all of these observations need to be removed because they have missing values on these variables. So if a given observation has a missing value on any of the variables, we want to remove that row. Because we're going to need values on all the all the columns for every row, otherwise we can't use that row in our data. CompuStat, annual. Now in MATLAB, a missing values are always, there are no blank cells in MATLAB. It does not allow a cell to be blank. So it'll just put NAN if it has a double data type, which these are double arrays. And if it's a date data type, it'll put NAT. NAN stands for not applicable number. 
NAT stands for not applicable time or date. Like over here in CompuStat quarterly, the RDQ variable is a date time variable. It's not a double variable, so it has NAT for missing observations. Not applicable time or date. So CompuStat annual, um, any row that has a NAN in it. So is NAN of CompuStat annual all rows all columns take the is nan of that <coughs> and then we're going to use the any function So it's these rows of CompuStat annual, all columns that we want deleted. This will pick out the rows which have a NAN in any of the columns. And in a previous video, I went and looked at that in more detail, but I'm not going to spend the time to do that now. Remove all firm year observations with missing values on any of the variables or who have a NAN in any of the columns. So you can see CompuStat annual will shrink, the sample will shrink from 88,378 rows to 67,869 rows as you see. Now for CompuStat quarterly Let's remove all rows which don't have four for fiscal quarter because we only care about the annual report announcement date, not quarter three's announcement date, quarter two, quarter one, but just the annual report or the quarter four earnings announcement date. So comp CompuStat quarterly, the rows where you don't see a four, In the fiscal quarter variable column, all columns, delete them. So this should shrink by, I guess, a factor of four, about. Now what we want to do is convert RDQ to a double array, from a date time to a double array. In MATLAB, it's hard to work with date time data types. Everything else we usually work with are double data types or numeric data types. So we're going to convert RDQ to a double we're going to get rid of those dashes. We're going to convert it to a double using the YYYMMDD function, which basically just turns this into the number 19720406 and removes the dashes. So compustat.rdq set it equal to YYYYMMDD of compustat quarterly. RDQ. That just changes the variable's data type. So now you'll see after this Oh, whoops. CompuStat quarterly RDQ. I don't know why it didn't give me an error. Now you should see that RDQ, the NATs have been changed to NANs because now this has a double data type. And the, the dates have been changed. It's the same date, it's just formatted slightly differently. It doesn't have the dashes. And these are numbers now.
And now with CompuStat Quarterly, we can also remove any row which has a NAND value in any of the columns. The isNAND function only works on numeric, on uh, double arrays. And CompuStat Quarterly is a table. You can see a table array. So we only want to put inside the isNAND function the double portion of that table array. So you use curly braces here. I've said this in previous video. If we would have just done this, if we would have put parentheses, then that treats CompuStat Quarterly as the table array, which includes the variable names up here. But if we put curly braces, it just takes the double portion of this table array, which is just all of this stuff, not counting the, the variable names. If you try to put th this like this into the isNAND function, it won't work. It'll give an error or something about improper data type for isNAND or something like that. Here, we'll do it. I'll make the code exactly correct except for that one piece and we'll see what error we get. Oh, whoops, I typed something, my bad. There we go. You see here. Uh, oh, did I? So I have another error other than that one. Uh, what is my other error? Right here. That's my other error. So now I should only have the error with, that I spoke of earlier. See, incorrect number or types of inputs or outputs for function is nan. Incorrect type of input is what happened there. In, incorrect data type. With the parentheses, this is a table. With the curly braces, it's just the double portion of that table. And is nan only supports double data types, double array data types. So this should work. Now, CompuStat quarterly should shrink any row which has a NAND value in any of the columns, like this row, these two rows, and so forth, should be deleted. All right. Now let's merge. I'm going to create a, uh, a table just called CompuStat data, and it's going to be the merge. So using the inner join function, the merge of CompuStat annual with CompuStat quarterly. And I'm going to merge on GV key and F year in that data set. And in CompuStat quarterly, it's also called GV key and F year. I'm going to merge on both of those variables so that I'm sorry, in CompuStat Quarterly, it's called GV key and F year Q. It's still the fiscal, it's the fiscal year. It's called F year Q in CompuStat Quarterly, and over here in CompuStat Annual, it's called F year. So I'm using GV key and F year in CompuStat Annual, merged with CompuStat Quarterly using GV key and F year Q so that we can get the report date of quarterly earnings for all these firms whose earnings data we have in CompuStat Annual. So the way you do this is you use enter join. We're joining this data set, this table, with this table. And enter join only works on table arrays, not double arrays. So we're joining this table with this table. On what variables? Well, in the left data set, this one, um, the variables we're joining on are called GV key and F year 
And in the right data set, GV key and F year are also called GV key. And they're called, in the quarterly data set, the, G, the F year was called F year Q, I believe. So our CompuStat data now, right here, should be the merge of this and this. Oh, this was created earlier from a step that we messed up. We don't need that anymore. So our CompuStat data was is a mer the merge of this and this on on a, a GD key and F here, and we have the RDQ now. And notice it did not keep the it doesn't have the GV key. It doesn't have F year Q in the merge. It doesn't have, it only has GV key and F year. It doesn't have GV key twice because it gets rid of the variables in the right data set whenever it's merged. It just keeps the ones in the left data set. It only keeps one copy of each, you see. This is the merge. This is the what you would think of when you merge two data sets together. For every GV key or F year combination row in this data set we found a corresponding row in this data set with the same gv key and f here and we've put the and we put the rdq of that row oh i think f quarter is also in here f quarter also came from compustat quarterly when we did the merge yeah obviously if there's a particular gv key f year row in this data set which it can't find in this data set then it that won't be in the merge and vice versa, if there's a particular GV key F your Q in this data set, which isn't in the other data set, that won't be in the merge. But it's the inner join, right? If you think about if you think about Venn diagram, two circles which overlap each other, that point where they overlap, that's what we've done. Now let's remove the variables we don't need in CompuStat data anymore. So those would be F year and F quarter. We don't need those variables anymore. We'll look here and I'll show you. Copy stat data. We don't need this variable anymore. We already know that all these firms have a fiscal year end month of 12. Um, and we all know that this fiscal quarter for all of these is four because that came from here. So we don't need these two variables anymore. But the other variables we need Uh, oh, again, I got to set it equal to empty if I want to delete them. So all rows, these columns or these variables set equal to empty, which means delete. And you can see they're gone now. All right. And I want to arrange the variables. I want to use the move vars function. So I want to arrange them. I want to put RDQ, then net income, then EPSPI after F year. In other words, I want it GV key, F year, RDQ, NI, EPSPI, and then adjusted common shares. So I want RDQ, then NI, then EPSPI, all after F year. So you just use the move variables function. What variables do I want to remove? Do I want to move RDQ, NI, EPSPI? And where do I want to move those variables? after, use the after argument in the move variables function, after a particular variable F year. All 
why am I doing this? You don't have to do this. I just visually, that's how I want to see the data. So here we go. GV key, F year, RDQ, NI, EPSPI, adjusted common shares. Here's our variable one. This is one variable that from, that uh, Ball and Brown used to measure net in, measure income. They use net income. And here's our other variable that we're going to use, variable two from their paper. They use earnings per share to, me to measure income as well. And they also have a variable three in their paper, as you saw. Variable three here, but we're not going to do variable three. I'm just going to use variable one, variables one and two. All right. All right, now let's get the unique GV keys. So firms equal unique. Data dot GV key. Unique firm identifiers. From CompuStat data, the unique values in column one. So we have 4,593 firms represented thus far over this 20 year sample time period. But we haven't assured that each of these firms have data on all 20. It's actually 21 years, 70 through 90, because each firm has to have data. Each firm that ends up in our sample, any firm that's going to be included in our sample has to have data for all 21 years, for each of the years, 1970 through 1990. Just change this to 70 and this to 90, and then it has to fit there exactly what their paper did. So we need to get all the firms first now let's delete firms which don't have earnings data in each year see page 167 which this is page 167 right here so right here So what I'm going to do is convert now to a double array for faster computation. I'm going to take our CompuStat data table array, and I'm just going to create a double array called CompuStat. Just the double portion of the table array CompuStat data. MATLAB can do things faster using double arrays versus table arrays. The downside is with the double array, we no longer have the table, the table variable names. But you can notice here when I run this, CompuStat will be a, it'll say double instead of table. And there it is. But we lost our variable names. We just have to remember this is GV key, this is fiscal year, this is report date of quarterly earnings, and this is all fourth quarter. For example, the fourth quarter, so GV Key 1000, fiscal year 1971, reported their fourth quarterly earnings on April 6th of 1972. It took a long time to report, and so forth and so on. This was our um, net income, and it's in millions of dollars. This is our earnings per share in dollars, obviously. And this is our com adjusted common shares outstanding in millions. That's how the data comes in from the from our very beginning data sets. So now what we want to do is we want to run a we want to run some code to basically check for each for each unique unique firm and we have all the unique firms right here in our little firms matrix which we created with this step we use the unique function for each of these firms 
we want to like for this one we want to go find we want to go find on how many rows does this particular firm show up in our data here and if it doesn't show up for all of the years 1970 through 1990 that's 21 times 21 rows if it doesn't show up on 21 rows then the firm doesn't satisfy this first criteria it's got to have data for each of the years so all these rows need to get deleted and in the firm's little matrix here little double array then this set does equal to NAN and eventually we'll delete it so that's what we're gonna do now so we're gonna do a for loop let I start at 1 increment by 1 and go all the way up to This will be where I ends. Starts at one, increments by one, so one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to whatever the size of the firm's double array is in the rows direction. So we use our size uh, function in MATLAB. Size of a double array. Put a one here in the rows direction. Put a two here for the columns direction. So in the rows direction, the firm's double array is 4,593. In the columns direction, obviously, it only has one column. So we're going from I starting at 1, increment by 1, all the way up to 4,593. That's how many firms there are. And if, we're going to do an if-then statement. So if firms I1 equals CompuStat all rows column 1. So this right here is a logical. This will report a logical. It'll, the logical will be the same size as this in terms of the number of rows. So it'll be how many of a rows CompuStat has. And on each one of the rows of the logical, though, there will be a 1 if, so let's set i equal to 1 here, if 1,000 corresponds to that particular row of CompuStat column 1, a 0 otherwise. So just to show you what this looks like. When i equals 1. It's just this logical here. It has the same size as CompuStat. There's a 1 if that firm 1,000 is. You find that on the, at that particular row of CompuStat column 1. 0 otherwise. So all we have to do is take the sum of this logical. And if the sum is less than 21, then we have a problem. So if the sum is less than, but instead of making our code really, gen, really a specific like that, 21, we're going to make it general. Because if we say if we put 21 there, and then we decide we decide to use an 18-year sample time period later, when we bring in data from 1970 through 1988. We use an 18-year sample time period, then, then all the firms will satisfy this criteria. There won't be any that have any data up to 21 because we have an 18-year sample time period. So we have to change it. We have to go in and manually change this to 18. We don't want to do that. We want to make our code as general as possible. So how can we get 21 another way that's general relative to our particular sample? All we have to do is take the unique function, column 2 of CompuStat, that'll pull out the unique years, which should be 1970, 71, all the way up 1990. So let's just verify that. The unique years are actually 71 through 90. So now, and then just compute the size of this double array in the rows direction, which is 20. So we just need the size of unique CompuStat 
all rows column two. The size of that in the rows direction. So if the sum of this is less than this, it'll be 20 here. Oh, you don't put a semicolon after the if here. Then let CompuStat, all those rows where firms I1 equals CompuStat, all rows column one, all columns be deleted. And also, we'll let firms I1 equal NAN. In the if then. And notice there's no. Oh, so that's if this condition happens, then do this and do this. But if this condition doesn't happen, else it doesn't. We're not saying what to do. It's not going to do anything then, which is fine. It's just we're trying to delete firms. We're trying to delete firm year observations, like all of these, for any firm in here which doesn't have at least a full panel of data over the full time period. Only keep those firms that have a full panel of data. And then also for those same firm for those firms where we didn't find like firms one one, the firms double array, row one, column one, this number here, one thousand, that was one of the firms. We're gonna set that equal to NAN. and so forth. So let's run this for loop. You can see lots of them are set to NAN and there's only a few that aren't set to NAN that have a full panel of data and you can see CompuStat got a lot smaller and then now we're gonna get rid of any rows of our firm's double array, which has a NAN in it. And you've seen this before. So we did have 4,593 firms. We're left with 326 firms. We can go ahead and clear CompuStat annual and CompuStat quarterly. We're not going to use those anymore. And since they're taking up RAM memory, storing them sitting there, and we might want to free up that RAM memory. I don't have to free it up because I have a computer that has plenty of excess memory. Those could sit right there, and I'll still be able to run the rest of these my code but for someone who's running right near capacity of RAM going ahead and running that line of code will help will help all right now let's deal with crisp so if we look at our CompuStat, we have every one of these firms has a full 20 years of data. We got fiscal year, report date for the fourth quarter earnings, net income, earnings per share, common shares out, adjusted common shares outstanding. This is in millions of dollars. This is in dollars. This is in millions of shares. There's no NANs or anything. All right, now let's go ahead and deal with the crisp data, the stock price stuff. 
stock data. Now the CRISP data, it, the firm identifier in CRISP is PERMNO, not GVKey. So we're going, we're, we are going to have to merge at some point later. But we need to get rid of any row where the share code is not equal to 10 or 11. So we've done this before in previous videos. So any row where, where in the share code column you see not a 10 and you see not an 11, think logically here, all columns, we're going to delete those. So basically these are the rows of crisp, all columns, we're going to delete. And what rows are though? Any row where in the share code column, if it's not equal to 10 and it's not equal to 11. Don't put or, that won't work. A vertical line means or in MATLAB logically. Two verticals also mean or. Two ampersands mean and, but usually I just use one. If you put or, that means in a row, if it doesn't see 10 in the share code column, if, it, if, if it's not 10 in the share code column, or it's not 11, then it will delete those rows. So anywhere where it sees a 10, well, that's not 11, so that'll get deleted. If it sees 11, well, that's not 10, that'll get deleted. They'll, they'll, those are all get deleted. So it's and. It has to, if it sees, if it doesn't see a 10 and it doesn't see an 11, um, then delete it. Let's convert the date variable to just a year and a month. So first we'll use our year, year, year MMDD function to convert the date variable to a double array. Well, let's convert it to a double array first, and then we'll worry about only a year and a month uh, later. Because currently it's, you see a date time variable, just like we did with the CompuStat. So now it's a double variable. We'll just get year and month here in a, in a bit. Let's remove all firm months with missing observations on any variable. This is crisp monthly return data, right? For example, uh, 1986, the last trading day of January was January 31st. The monthly return, it was missing. The monthly return for the whole market was this. This is the monthly return for this particular security and so forth and so on. So let's delete any row in a crisp data where there's a NAN in any of the variables. So we've done this before. It's basically what we did up here. We can just copy and paste. We did the same thing for CompuStat. We did it here. We also did it here as well. So just copy this. Instead of having to type all this, you can just copy and paste and then just change this to crisp. Because we know that this code does that. It deletes any row in the table where there is a NAND value in any of the columns, any function. If you only want to delete a row if it has a NAND value in all of the columns, then you use the all function here. But I want a row deleted if it has a NAND value anywhere, anywhere in that row, in any of the columns.
Um, now I can go ahead and remove the share code variable because we already have assured up here on this line of code that we only have share codes 10 and 11 left. All right. So the last line of code I actually ran was this one. So that was this line. So I haven't run these two lines yet. So let me go ahead and run these. You can see crisp will get a lot smaller. Oh, you know what? I didn't end up running this line. I don't see that down here in my history. I ran this. I typed this line. I typed this line and ran this line, but I didn't run those other ones. And I've already removed the share code variable. Ooh, this is a problem. So this is what we can do. We can just run what we can do, just start all over. Just run all the code from start to be, so from start to finish right now. And since we had these two things here, it will clear all the variables first, clear the command window, and then it'll run all this again and everything should be fine. So I'm just going to do control A, control all, hit F9. It'll run everything. Now it may take a little second because there's a lot of stuff here to run. But there, now we're done. So now we're up to date. You know what I want to do? I want to back up here and run this from the get-go and just see something really quickly. So crisp, 1392659, that's how many, 1,392659, and then I'm going to run down through here now, run this. And then just this line, this deletes all rows where the share code is not 10 or 11. I thought that would delete more rows than it did. I thought it would delete about half of the rows, but it didn't. Oh, because of our time period is a long time ago, there weren't things that were weird things that were traded on the stock exchanges. They were mostly common stocks. But you run the same line of code on on a crisp on a crisp data set, you know, from the last 10 years and half of the rows will be deleted because there are so many other types of securities that are traded now that aren't common stocks. It makes sense. All right, let's do that. So now crisp, we have our permno date return monthly return and equally weighted market monthly return. And the this includes this includes um, any dividends. That's what D stands for distributions. This includes div dividends and, and is adjusted for stock splits and things like that. Same as same as this. All right, let's go ahead and convert to a double array for faster computation. We've done this already before. We did it for the CompuStat data up here. We're going to do it for the crisp as well. Now let's bring in the linking table and merge crisp data to get GV key. We're going to have to merge the crisp data with the CompuStat data to get the GV key. Because we got to match firms. If we're going to replicate this this figure here, we got to know f for for the given firms when when they announce earnings for the year, what month, we got to know what their unexpected income is. We got to know if it's positive or negative. We also got to know what its return is. 
Returns are in Chris. Income's in CompuStat. CompuStat uses GVKey. Crisp uses Permno. We're going to have to match these up at some point. So I'm going to go ahead and do it now. So we have a linking table, and I've talked about this in a previous video, how to link CRISP and CompuStat data together. But I'm going to go ahead and bring in the linking table. I'm going to call it linking data. And let's go ahead and bring it in. load the linking data table this is a table that the data that I've downloaded it has GV key link type and LU and LC are the only link types we want those are the reliable link types L perm no which really is perm number L perm co which we don't need start date where these two things were linked together and the end date where these two things so if you're anywhere in this time frame, you can be assured that this perm number and this GV key are the same, same company. This is the company, and this is the security. This is a common stock of this company. So a, a company could have more than one type of common stock, and each type of common stock would get its own perm no. Because perm no is basically a security identifier, not a firm identifier. GV key is the actual company identifier. Let's go ahead in the linking data table, delete any um, delete any row here where we don't know this the link start date or the link end date. So where there's a nat. We can use the isNat function because these two variables are both date time. Or we can convert those variables to a double array using the YYY MMDD function and then use the isNan function for double arrays. For numbers, but I'm going to use the isNat function. So it's basically our code that we did earlier. I think I still have it copied and pasted. This code. This is we're going to use the isNat. And we're not looking for the whole, the whole data. We're just looking these two columns. So if either of these columns is NAN, has a NAN value in it, we want to delete those rows. So all rows, columns five through end, end means the last column, which is six in this case. So after we ran this, uh, this row will get deleted because this is missing. This row will get deleted. This row will get deleted and so forth and so on. So linking data lost about 7,000 rows. All right. Now let's go ahead and delete, delete link type and L perm co. We don't need those anymore. And just so you know, variable names in MATLAB are case sensitive. I've said this before in previous videos. So we don't have those variables anymore. We can go ahead and change L perm no to just regular perm no, because that's what it is. But we don't have to. We don't have to change the variable name. 
Now I'm going to convert linking data. I'm going to set link equal to linking data, double portion, convert it to a double array for faster computation. <laughs> but the way I'm going to do this is linking data, all rows, columns one through two will be the first two columns of the link double array. And then the next two columns will be these two columns, but converted to a double array because they're a date time and you can't put date time variables in a double array. You have to convert them to a double variables. So we'll use the YYMMDD function, um, which converts a date time variable to a double array. All rows, columns three through end because now end is the fourth column or three through four if you wanted to do it that way. If I try to just do link equals linking data like this, like I've done before to convert to a double, you could, this will only work if all the, if all the columns in this table are have a double data type otherwise it's just going to give an error see all inputs must be it won't it won't let you do it the first two columns of linking data do have a double data type so i can do that right these are both double but the other two are date time and so i have to convert those first before putting them and then this means a matrix So now here's link. You can see the dates now converted without the dashes between them. All right, we're almost done with this video, we're getting very close to a stopping point. But one one last little push here. So what I want to do now is I want to add to our crisp Oh, did I not run? I didn't run this line yet, this line of code. There's our crisp. What I want to do is I want to add to column five of our crisp data. I want to, this is permno, column one. In column five, I want to put GV key. So I want to go row by row through this data, row by row, and ask the question, can I find in row one, can I find column one in column two of the link matrix anywhere in column two? Can I also find column two greater than column three greater than or equal to column three and less than or equal to column four. I mean, that's what I want to find. So like, first of all, what row can I, like, can I find this right here anywhere in this? This is the perm no column in the link link table, right? Linking data perm no is in the second column. So, Permno 10,000. I want to know what its GV key is, right? That's what I want to know. So the link table gives the GV key for every Permno, but only over certain date ranges. So I asked the question, I want to find this in the link table column two. Let's say I found it right on, on row 19. Well, that's fine if I found it on row 19. That's not necessarily the GV key though, only, only if only if this date right here lies in this date range, then that will be the GV key. You see what I mean? But otherwise that won't be the GV key because only it only, it only, these two are only linked together over this date range. And so if that date, now I know that that isn't 1000 right there, but I'm just giving an example. 
So that's what we want to do next. So write an if then statement. We're going to do a for loop with a nested if then statement. So for i equals one, increment by one, go all the way up to how many of our rows are in our crisp data set, which is 1,207,349. And I'm going to do an if then statement. And I'm looking crisp row i column one needs to equal link all rows column two and at the same time crisp row i column two that's the date column has to be greater than or equal to link all rows column three so greater than the link greater than or equal to the link start date and also has to be less than or equal to the link end date, which is in column four of link. That's three conditions that have to hold for a given row of crisp. Column one has to equal one of the perm nodes in the link table. Column two has to be greater than or equal to the corresponding column three of the link table. Column two also has to be less than or equal to corresponding column four. So this is just a logical. This will give a logical array. It will have the same size as the link table rows, 26,502. And it's just a logical. There'll be a one on one of these rows if that particular row of the link table satisfies the condition, zero otherwise. So if the sum of this logical is greater than zero, that means we found a link for that particular perm no. If the sum is zero, then we didn't find a link. We that means for that particular perm no, if that if if those three conditions aren't satisfied, which would mean we didn't we either didn't find this perm no anywhere in column two of the link table, or we may have found it, but the corresponding date didn't wasn't in the particular range, then that logical will just be zero in every row. So if the sum of the logical is zero, then crisp what we're going to do is set crisp row i all columns equal to nan so forth but if it's greater than zero so that'll be in the else category down there if it's greater than zero then we're going to let crisp row i column five be be that gv key so it'll be the link it'll be the row where that happened Well, it may have happened on more than run one row. That's the, that's the problem. This may occur on more than one row. This right here may occur on more than one row. So what we'll do is we'll put that inside a find function. Find where that happens the last time. Find the last time where that happens. So that'll find that row of the link table the last row where that particular, where those set of logicals are satisfied, column one, which is the GV key. And I'll try to illustrate this here in a second. Else, else what? Else if this doesn't, if this is not true, which means the sum is less than or equal to zero, well it won't be less than zero, but it could be equal to zero, then just, let Chris row I all columns equal NAND. In the if then, in the for loop. So let me give you an example maybe of where um, let's take
This sum usually is either going to be zero or it's going to be one. But every now and then it may be two or sometimes three. There's three different rows where this holds. I'm trying to give an example. If I just randomly picked, I'm not likely to get, I'm just going to put 10,000 there. I'm not likely going to get a hit for what I want. I'm going to have to go find it. So that sum was one. So let's let's just look at where that happened. Instead of just column one, I want all the columns. So that row, that particular row of the link table. So Chris, row 10,000, column one, row 10,000. It must be the permno 10,0092. It must say that for the permno. Let me get that up on the screen so we can see. What is crisp row 10,000 all columns look like? So there's what. Oh, I made, made a mistake here. What did I do? I should have, so there's row, crisp row 10,000. I should have changed it to this. Trying to think where. I'm trying to show you an example. Maybe maybe I'm doing this wrong. What if I just pick this perm now? Twenty five oh oh five. Let me start over. If I do. I, I don't know. This is going to take too long. to. But the point is, there may be more than one. All right, here's the point. So for this particular perm permno, for example, when we look in the link table, column two, it may find that permno on more than two row, on more than one row. It may not find it on any row, but it may find it on more than one row, not just one row. Let's say it finds it on this row and this row. Let's say both of these say um, 25005. Let's just say they both say that. And then over this date range, this permno linked to that GV key. And then over a different date range, the same permno, let's say it's that same permno, 25005, it linked to a different GV key. So we want the most recent GV key link. That's the idea. And that's why we, we, we had to do this part right here. This part. Find the find function. It finds the row. It finds those rows of the link table where this logical is satisfied. And if there's more than one of them, then we put, then that's three different rows there. So we, we want the last row. 
and you always put a one right here. Don't worry about that one. Find the last row where that happens. So it's that particular row of the link table, column one. So if, the, if these two rows were a match, would find the last row of the link table, column one, and that's what it would assign for the GV key. We're assigning the GV key to column five of CRISP. So I guess that's the best way to explain it. Let's go ahead and run this. And this step takes, takes a while. And then after this, what we will do is we will go ahead and get rid of any row in our crisp matrix which has a NAND value in all the columns. Because we're setting any rows where it can't do the match, we're setting those we're setting those all NAND. You can see right here, that's the else. So crisp all is NAND crisp equal empty. This will delete all rows of crisp that have NAN in every column because we use all here. And really we could use any. There aren't any NANs in crisp now. We already took care of that. So if there's a NAN in all of them, then there's a NAN in any. You know what I mean? If there's a NAN in any of the columns, there's a NAN in all of them. So it doesn't matter which one we use. If we do this here, this should greatly decrease our crisp. And now we have the GV key that matches to each of these perm nodes. And we can check and make sure that we did the that our code is correct. For example, we could make sure does this perm node really link to this GV key when this oh, on this date? So we can like let's look at link. Uh, find the row where twelve nine nine four equals link all rows column one the GV key. All columns. Find the rows where that happens. Only one row had happened. This was GV key. This was the perm no. And these two were linked over this whole time range. And just make sure this date lies in that range. And it does, barely. You see? So that, that's right. That code's right. And we could, let's go just randomly check another one just to make sure. I know checking randomly two, two things doesn't mean that your code is completely right. But at least in MATLAB, you can quickly go check things just to see. So if we get link the row, so 5367 is the GV key. Find where that equals the all rows column one. So that's a logical. And the rows where that, the rows in link where that holds, all columns we want to pull out. 48880 was the GV key, was the perm no for this GV key. And the link was valid over this time frame. And all of these dates are in that time frame. Nineteen seventy one thirty was the first one, and that's inside this time frame. So, looks like we've gotten the we've done the right thing. All right, and then finally, I want to just put the GV key after the perm no. So I'm going to re rearrange crisp. I want I want column one, then I want column five, then I want columns two through four. So crisp. It's going to be crisp, all rows, column one, then column five, then two through four. All right. 
with that, we're going to end this video. And in the next video, we're going to go ahead and save this here as um, I'll save it on the desktop. Well, we need to keep it in our folder, don't we? Not in our data folder, but in our other folder. We'll save it. Um, well, we'll save it. In, I'll save it after the video ends. But anyway, we'll, I'll save this, um, this live script file. In the next video, we're going to go ahead and get into computing the change in income. We're going to start computing this change in income using this. We're going to have to run this regression. And then compute the un unexpected income. We'll do that in the next video. And then in the third video, we'll probably do the market stuff, compute the abnormal, abnormal return, and then replicate uh, figure one in the paper. So I hope, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that you're, you've learned some things. And I'll see you on the next one.